Hey everybody, welcome to Chuck Yates Needs a Job, the podcast, and we're going to try. We are going to try to make the Merchant Marine Act of 1920, Section 27, sexy, fun, and entertaining today, and I found the right guy to do this. Colin, welcome on. Well, Chuck, thanks for having me on the show. Look forward to it. The uh, So, Colin, let's level set for my mom, because I do know my mom will actually watch this. Tell us who you are. Tell us about the Cato Institute, and then we'll kind of jump into geeky Jones Act stuff. Yeah, so my name is Colin Grabo. I am a research fellow at the Cato Institute uh, at the Herbert E. Uh, Stateful Center for Trade Policy Studies, where I basically focus on dumb U.S. laws that uh, try to block the importation of U.S. Uh, foreign goods or services, uh, things like the Jones Act, which we're going to talk about, but also other things like the U.S. Sugar Program, which for those unfamiliar is a law that uh, uh, blocks or puts substantial barriers on the importation of foreign sugar. This is why, for example, your Coca-Cola that you drink is made from high fructose corn syrup, while in Mexico they use actual sugar because it's a lot cheaper down there. Uh, so things like that, but uh, I'd say you know wildly disproportionate of how my time is spent on okay, Colin, maritime on, Colin, Colin, I am drawing a line in the sand here. This might be our first fight of the podcast. I live in Richmond, Texas, which is the next town over from Sugarland, Texas, started by the Imperial Sugar Factory and the company. Are they the ones that caused all your sugar problems? Well, I'm not familiar with Sugarland, uh, Texas and its origins, but uh, Texas is home to some sugarcane production. And some of the folks there have definitely have an interest in maintaining this law and making sure that we can't get access to cheaper foreign sugar so that we have to turn to Americans and pay them higher prices. All right. So that usually us Texans get insert, insulted way worse than that. So we haven't had a fight yet. That's perfect. But uh so Merchant uh, Marine Act of 1920, Section 27, wh what is that? Yeah, the, the Section 27 basically states that if you want to move something by water within the United States, you have to use a vessel that meets four conditions. Uh, the vessel has to be flagged and registered here in the United States as opposed to a foreign country. It has to be built here in the United States. It has to be uh, crewed by Americans, and it has to be at least 75% owned by Americans. And so that, that all sounds great, particularly in a post-pandemic world where we couldn't get toilet paper and all. When's that passed? When, when, did, the, uh, when did the Jones Act pass? Yeah, so fortunately, we're going to get into a, a little bit of a lengthy backstory. I'm going to try to condense it as much as I can. So so like you said, this is the Merchant Marine Act of 1920. So a reasonable person might think, okay, so this comes about in 1920. This means that pre-1920, you could you know use whatever ship you want. It was a very different environment. And in fact, these uh, we've had laws very similar to the Jones Act dating back to the country's founding. You go back to, I think, 1789, like the third act of Congress uh, said, well, you can use foreign ships, but you're going to have to pay a lot. They put heavy tariffs on the use of foreign ships to transport goods domestically. Um, and then in 1817, they just said, OK, no more foreign ships. It doesn't matter. Okay, there's no tariffs. Just You just can't use them. Um, but I think it's useful. So some people may hear this and think, OK, so the founding fathers thought this was a good idea and you're against it. You know, why, why is that? What's going on here? Uh, I think we have to keep in mind the context was very, very different at the country's founding than it is today. Uh, back then, U.S. shipping and shipbuilding was some of the world's best. Uh, this isn't a big surprise. The 13 original colonies, of course, they were uh, along the ocean. Uh, we had big supplies of, of timber, which was an important uh, material. This is back in the days of wooden ships used sail power. Uh, so we were very good at building ships. So being forced to use American ships was not a big imposition and also had the benefit of uh, creating this large U.S. merchant fleet. That, you know, in case a war broke out, you could take some of the ships and load them with cannon and they could kind of serve as an auxiliary for the Navy and go hunt enemy shipping. 
But as time goes on, this changes. Uh, we go from some of the world's best uh, shipping and ship building to becoming very uncompetitive. This especially pronounced, uh, you know, around the Civil War time, uh, we see the change over to, you know, ships made of iron and steam. And Americans, uh, American built ships become, instead of, you know, um, cheaper than most, become, you know, 25 to 50 percent more expensive. And so people start looking for ways around these these types of laws. I I don't want to use an American ship. So in the early 1890s, someone hits on this idea of sending 250 kegs of nails from New York to California, and they did it through Belgium. They loaded all the nails, all these kegs of nails on a Belgian ship sent to Antwerp, Belgium. The nails get transferred to a British ship. Then it goes from Antwerp all the way to California. And they did the math and figured this still makes more sense than using an American ship going on a more direct route. So there's actually a court case about this. And the court rules and says, no, actually, that complies with American law. So Congress changes the law and says, no, 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 no. If it starts and finishes in the U.S., I don't care if you go to a foreign port first. You have to use an American ship. But there was still one more loophole you could uh, where you could get around the law. And that was if you're shipping goods to and from Alaska. What people were doing is they would send goods not by water to um to Vancouver, but they would take the goods over land to Vancouver to a foreign port and then go on a foreign ship from Vancouver to Alaska back and forth. So who hated this? Well, shipping companies in Seattle, Washington, they said, no, 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 this is unfair foreign competition. That should all go on our ships. And by the way, we're represented in the Senate by Senator Wesley Jones of Washington State. So World War I comes along. The United States doesn't have enough ships. We have to build lots of ships, hundreds of new ships. Well, most of these ships don't get built until after the war is over. The United States joined in 1917. The war is over in late 1918. So most of the ships are delivered, you know, 1920, 1919, 1921. So government has to figure out what do we do with all these ships? And they got the idea, okay, let's pass this Merchant Marine Act of 1920. And part of it is disposing of those ships. But they thought, you know, while we're at it, we should just revisit U.S. maritime industry uh, or policy more broadly. And then in 1920, these uh, representative from the Pacific Steamship Company in Seattle says, you know, while you guys are at it, you should do something else. It was unfair foreign competition we're facing here in, 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 in Seattle from, from the Canadians. And here's a proposed legislation we think would be a good idea. And if you look at the language of what was proposed by the Pacific Steamship Company and what was actually adopted as Section 27, it's like 90% the same. So basically, that's the long story. This was kind of a, a favor, uh, you know, a payoff, arguably, to uh, the, the Pacific Steamship Company in, in Seattle so they could block Americans getting access to foreign shipping when transferring goods to and from Alaska. So kudos to you for doing that in as short a period as you did. I was having a coffee this morning, as I do every morning, at Joseph's Coffee Shop in Richmond, Texas, and all the old guys sit around the table, and they're going, what's on the podcast today? I go, Jones Act, and a former BP engineer who ran one of the refineries in Washington or one of the chemical plants in Washington's told the same story you did, but he took 28 minutes. So, (laughs) but, but it was basically Washington, Seattle, locking down trade with Alaska for, for, and they kind of supposedly had to cut in San Francisco and San Diego as well, and LA. It was like, we're locking in these shipping lanes for it. What becomes really interesting later on, skipping ahead, is BP goes up there, finds a ton of oil in Alaska, and if you know the oil business, it's not as simple as we're a closed loop system. Let's be energy independent. We we don't we need certain types of oil to re- refine in our refiners, and so to some degree, oil has to be fungible. We need heavier crude from Saudi Arabia to run in our refineries. We get it some of that from Venezuela, et cetera. So BP finds all this oil in Alaska, and they run through all their economics and everything. And the thing that works best for them, best for the consumer, is they're going to ship all that oil to Japan. And then they're going to divert the oil from Saudi Arabia that Japan's taking to the U.S. Gulf Coast because they need the heavier, the heavier crudes from, from Saudi Arabia to do that. And uh-uh, 
nope, can't do that because they passed something, some other law or some supplement to the Jones Act. You can't do that. You can't ship oil outside the United States. So, so they use this as a grab bag. It's the gift that keeps on giving, I guess, is the way to put it. Yeah. Um, like you said, I think, you know, we used to have the oil export ban for a long time. Um, and, you know, there's actually a study done by the you know, the G- Government Accountability Office back in the late 90s. It looked at shipping um, North Slope crude oil to different uh, both internationally and to other parts of the United States. And this amazing chart and it showed that to send oil from Alaska to the Gulf Coast cost three times more than to send that same oil to the U.S. Virgin Islands, which is exempt from the Jones Act. But the kicker of the whole thing is that that ship going to the Virgin Islands went down around the tip of South America because I think they're using a tanker that's too big to go through the Panama Canal. And the journey took, I think, twice as long, but was one-third the price. Um, so that suggests kind of the scale of the cost we're talking about when we say, you know, Jones Act shipping is more expensive. Yeah, no, kind of crazy. I'm going to circle back to the energy business in a, in a little bit, but maybe give me two or three or four, or as, as many as you want, kind of gripes about the Jones Act, you know, stories about how it costs more ludicrous things. I heard, you know, a buddy that goes San Diego to Hawaii on a cruise ship and has to stop in Mexico for four hours before they come back. Give me some of that color. And then where I want to go after we hear about all the costs of the Jones Act, I want to turn around and say, well, what are we getting for that protectionism? You know? Yeah. So, To kind of appreciate into some of the costs of the Jones Act, I think we should start with the U.S. shipbuilding requirement. So, again, one of the requirements of the Jones Act is you have to use a U.S. built ship. So if you have a foreign built ship, it doesn't matter if you put an American flag on a crew with Americans, own it by Americans. It violates the Jones Act. So um, the problem with that is that U.S. built ships are incredibly more expensive than ones built abroad. Let me give you a concrete example. So the last Jones Act ship built uh, this year uh, it's the only Jones Act ship built this year. Is a container ship. It has a capacity of around 2,500 TEUs. A TEU is a 20-foot equivalent unit. So a 20-foot shipping container is one TEU. A 40-foot shipping container is two TEUs. So that cost over $225 million. Two years ago, two 2,500 TEU ships were ordered from a shipyard in South Korea for $41 million each. So $41 million versus over $225 million. We're talking roughly, you know, a 5X delta right there on the capital costs. Um, Obviously, that has an effect. Uh, Among other things, it discourages the use of shipping because, you know, we try to promote – Jones Act ostensibly is trying to promote shipping by making ships really expensive to buy. It's it's bizarre, and we don't get much shipbuilding for it. But you want to talk about – costs. Um, So, for example, in 2012, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York put out a study about Puerto Rico's economy. They said, uh, you know, if you want to send a shipping container from the East Coast to Puerto Rico, it costs a little over $3,000. If you want to send that same box to nearby Jamaica or the Dominican Republic, where the Jones Act doesn't apply, it's more like $1,500 to $1,600. Um, We see examples of, you know, I gave you the one with Alaska crude. Um, The Congressional Research Service put out a report several years ago uh, saying that ship oil from the Gulf Coast up to Canada was two to three times more expensive than to send it a shorter distance uh, to refineries in the Um, mid-Atlantic. Perhaps the craziest example, most nonsensical one, is when it comes to liquefied natural gas. The United States is one of the world's leading exporters of LNG, but we can't ship LNG to New England or to Puerto Rico because there are no Jones Act compliant LNG tankers to transport it. So they have to rely entirely on, on foreign imports. All the tankers that come in are foreign. Uh, we've even had notoriously a couple examples of uh, a Russian LNG being imported, even though we are you know, one of the world's leading producers. So you know, someone might hear that and think, well, Colin, this seems like an easy problem to solve. Just go build the ship, put some Americans on it, and there you go. But the math makes no sense. Um, back in 2019, I think, the Wall Street Journal had an article said to build an LNG tanker in Asia was about $180 million at the time. Uh, the estimated price for U.S. built was $700 million. So we're talking over half a billion dollars more per ship. No one's going to build that ship. The math doesn't make any sense. And so it is, here it is. This pro-American law results in Americans not getting access to American products. 
Yeah, that's that that's crazy. And I mean, you almost answered the second half of my question is like, well, what are we getting for this protectionism? You said one ship. I mean, I looked up Jones Act uh, stats earlier this morning. You know, back in the 80s, we had 250 Jones Act ships. And today we've got, what, 91? So, like, what are we if, – if take off your Cato Institute hat and put on your, you know, card-carrying member of the ACLU hat or Reds for America or Fair Play for Cuba, whatever, whatever you want to – whatever hat you want – what are the defenders of this act saying that we're getting for this? Yes. <clears throat> so if I was a steel man, the case for the Jones Act, try to make the most compelling case, it goes something like this. Um, <clears throat> the Jones Act U.S. build requirement uh, means that we have a shipping industry because we're required to build ships here. And that shipping industry, you know, in time of war, that's a good thing to have because you can go build ships for the military. Uh, you can repair ships. Um, so that's something you want for national security. It also means that we have, yeah, we don't have a lot, but like you said, uh, we have 90 some ships today that comply with the Jones Act. And then in time of war, you can grab those ships and say, hey, uh, you're going to carry goods, you, uh, supplies and equipment for the military to where it's needed, you know, to Iraq or, you know, where, wherever it may be. And then also the U.S. crew requirement uh, means that we have mariners that can both crew those ships who so have to rely on foreigners that may be unreliable or um, both the commercial ships and also govern the go- U.S. government owns sea lift ships as well. And though they, re- they, t- they rely on civilian mariners to crew those ships. So it means that we have mariners to crew ships for the government. And these are all critical items that you want to have uh, in time of war. So I think that's, that's the steel man case for the Jones Act. And, does that let's get really really micro about it narrow down on that is it three senators that you know the 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 mariners all live in a certain state that protect it what within our government is actually stopping it not just you know it's interesting i had breakfast with ted cruz uh senator cruz one morning i always love to name drop in my podcast it's kind of my thing but uh anyway and I just said, hey, what's the deal on the Jones Act? Can we please get rid of it? Because I went through the whole thing about, you know, it's ridiculous that we're importing Russian LNG into Massachusetts. Can we build a pipeline? Can we get rid of the Jones Act? And he just looked and rolled his eyes and said, don't even get me started. We've tried for years to get rid of the Jones Act. Not happening. So yeah, who's blocking it. So since you mentioned Senator Cruz, it's interesting. I think it was last year he did introduce some legislation. Uh, I think it was an amendment to a bill that would have exempted. He didn't even try to repeal the Jones Act. He just said, OK, can we just exempt LNG shipments from the Jones Act? Because he said, you know, this is generating nothing for the American industry. There are no ships. There are no Americans crewing the ships. We're not building the ships. Uh, so it's it's zero upside. It's 100 percent downside. So can we just exempt that? I think there was like a committee vote. And he lost something like 26 to 2, something like that. Really? Um, and you think this is the most common sense thing in the world. So, yeah, this, this raises an excellent question. So how, you know, how does this law persist? What is going on here? And I think it's basically it's a classic case of dispersed costs and concentrated benefits. Your average American has no idea that the Jones Act exists. Now, after your podcast comes out, that may change. Everyone gets aware but as of right now, people don't know. In fact, there was an episode of Jeopardy a few years ago uh, where the category was Puerto Rico, $500 question. The answer was the Jones Act, and nobody knew. And these, you know, these are Jeopardy contestants. These are smart, informed people. <laughs> um, meanwhile, the people that do know about the Jones Act, that tiny percentage of Americans that do know, these are people that know because they, they profit from the law. Uh, these are guys that you know work in the shipyards, that crew the ships, that own the ships. Um, they're, you know, they want to keep, they got a good thing going as they perceive it keeps out foreign competition. They want to keep that going. So they organize and, you know, off the top of my head, I could probably name a dozen groups, uh, in DC and elsewhere that lobby Congress consistently, um, to maintain the Jones Act. I mean, over on K Street, just a few blocks from here, we have the American Maritime Partnership. We have the American Waterway Operators. We have all the different maritime unions. We have the Lake Carriers Association. These are guys that have you know ships in the Great Lakes. Uh, we have the Offshore Marine Services Association, uh, the American Maritime Officers. I go down the list, but you get the point. 
and they're they're in DC every day, and they're making the case, and they donate. Um, you know, I think it was a couple of years ago, Matt Iglesias on Twitter, he, he said something along these lines of, I don't get why the Jones Act persists. What's going on? And someone responded to him and said, uh, I used to be a staffer for a member of Congress. And we were from Appalachia, I think, somewhere. And he said, look, we would get these guys who would donate to us. And all they asked was keep the Jones Act in place. We're not asking you to proactively do anything. We're not asking you to introduce any bill. We're just saying every Five or six years, when the Jones Act comes up, just vote the right way. That's it, you know? And nobody, you know, nobody ever walked and marched in their office and said, how dare you support the Jones Act? What are you doing? Um, so these are the dynamics. You know, if you go against the Jones Act, you're making enemies. Um, you know, life is not going to be easy for you. You just go along with it. You're going to get endorsements. You're going to get donations. You're going to get support. You know, it's just the path of least resistance. And I think, you know, we're talking about the Jones Act. We can be talking about any number of issues you know, they're dysfunctional. You go, why does this ridiculous thing keep going on? It's, it's, it's that basic dynamic. That's, that's interesting. Cause that, that, okay. That makes sense to me. I, I'm not saying I agree with it, but that at least makes sense of here's dollars. Just don't get rid of it. Yeah. Well, let me give you a concrete example. So make it less abstract. So you would think if you, you know, if you just had like a passing familiarity with the Jones Act, you would think, okay, so people in the contiguous United States, the 40, um, in the mainland, yeah, it makes sense they support the Jones Act uh, because maybe they're home in shipyards or something like that. But the guys in Alaska and Hawaii and Puerto Rico, they all got to hate it, right? They, they must go into Congress and rant and rave about it. Well, no. Um, you know, a couple of years uh, back in 2019, Senator Trump, some of, uh, Senator Trump, President Trump, some of his advisors present him with uh, an executive waiver said, Trump, uh, we think you should we should waive the Jones Act for 10 years, use executive power to um, not apply it to, to LNG so Americans get access to American LNG. And according to Bloomberg, Trump was like initially leaning in favor of it. He was thinking about doing it. And the next week, six senators went down there uh, to talk him out of it. Among them, Lisa Murkowski and Dan Sullivan of Alaska. You would think if anybody hates this law, it would be people from Alaska. In fact, People in Alaska hate this law so much. That back in 1984, they passed a, a referendum mandating, they made it part of the government's official duties to lobby Congress for repeal of the Jones Act. It's written into Alaska state law. The governor has to try to get rid of the Jones Act. And yet these senators are going to bat for it. Well, I can't tell you exactly what their motivations are, but I can tell you that if you go to Senator Dan Sullivan's uh, um, campaign website and look at his list of endorsements, of which there are 20-some, like four of them are from pro Jones Act groups from different maritime unions, like Masters, Mates, and Pilots unions, the Marine Engineers Beneficial Association, Seafarers International Union. So I don't think that's a coincidence. Same deal in Hawaii. Um, there is one member of the Hawaii delegation that opposes the Jones Act, Representative Ed Case. He gave an interview a few years ago and said, you know, he said, when I was a state legislator, I just asked the question, can we study this issue? I didn't even take a stance on it. I just said, can we study this? And he said, you would think the sky fell down on me. He said people just, um, um, you know, it was like apocalyptic. And he said the shipping companies, mo uh, you know, um, they uh, were mobilized against me and it made life very difficult. So you have someone in Hawaii going against the Jones Act and that makes his life more difficult. So I think that has a lot of explanatory power um, why the Jones Act still is on the books. So, so what you just said with a huge cloak of just ignorance by everybody. Makes a lot of sense to me. I'm going to go back and watch it. I had Kelly Chewbacca, uh, who ran for Senate up in Alaska on the podcast, and we were talking about things. I don't even think she brought it up. And it's not because, I mean, she's very intelligent. She's very well informed. It was probably her advisors saying, that's not even an issue to anyone. Don't bring it up. You know, no one knows about it. I mean, even though it's Alaska law, to say, please go lobby against it. Well, one other thing, you know, because you and I met on Twitter when somebody, I had posted something about the Jones Act and we all got going. Um, I'm not sure I understood this and maybe I missed it, but there was something that a foreign LNG tanker would show up in Texas, let's say down in Freeport, fill, fill up, but have a little bit of room left and maybe wanted to stop at uh, another uh, another LNG Phillips exporting station, and something about when they connect to the next, a little bit of the LNG goes into 
uh, to, in effect, kind of prime the pump so they can fill up the rest of the ship. And someone's designating that as, you know, domestic uh, trade. And so you can't use a foreign ship to do that. Did, generally speaking, I get that right. Yeah, that, that's basically it. There was a recent ruling from the Customs and Border Protection Agency, which they're the ones that interpret the Jones Act and make rulings about things. Um, you know, for example, uh, technically the Jones Act does not say, um, you know, transportation between two U.S. ports. It actually says two U.S. points. So then the question comes up, well, what's a point? And, you know, for example, if I want to transport, um, say, a bunch of rocks – uh, from the U.S. to an offshore wind site because they use these rocks as scour protection. Um, can I do that? And the CBP ruled. They said basically, well, if it's the pristine seabed of the of the of the seabed floor, um, that's not a point. But if you put a layer of rocks, then it is a point. Any subsequent transportation has to be uh, on a Jones Act compliant vessel. Well, you know, what you're talking about is, yeah, there was a, a ruling something along the lines of an LNG tanker, uh, you know, loads part partway in one uh, LNG terminal in the U.S. and goes to another LNG terminal. Well, you know, some of the boil off gas and the vaporized LNG um, at the second terminal, it, it goes into the lines um, there and then returns. So say, well, that vapor went from one U.S. port to another U.S. port and then got offloaded because it went up uh, through the through the lines there in the terminal. Um, that's transportation. That's a Jones Act violation. So that, yeah, these are some of the absurd outcomes uh, uh, you can you can bump up against when talking about this law. That's crazy. So now you've got me all riled up. All right. I'm really pissed off now. I'm educated on this issue. I'm hiring you to be my quote unquote political consultant. Give me our 2.5 point, 27 point plan of how we're going to change this. What are we what, what what are some some suggestions we should be doing now that I'm all riled up? Yeah, so I mean I think to you know, to change things, I think we need to emphasize a few things. First off, we need to make people aware of the law. You know, you're not going to get change over something that people just don't even really know uh, exists. But I think people need to understand. You know, earlier in our conversation, you know, I mentioned this is a you know U.S. bill, U.S. flagged, all the rest. I think your average person might hear them go, well, "That sounds pretty great." You know, employs Americans uh, in American shipyards. You know, what kind of monster could be against such a law? Uh, I think we need to emphasize. This law, I think, is properly understood as basically a tax on American commerce. You know, if I want to sell something from uh, one, and if I'm uh, in New York, I want to sell something to someone in California. We we live in a huge country, and distance is a barrier to trade. And having efficient domestic transport is a is a way to connect people and enable that trade. And so we're in a situation where if I want to sell to another American, I got to pay this expensive Jones Act tax. But if I want to sell to someone overseas or if I want to buy from someone overseas, I can use, you know, much more efficient international shipping. So it basically tilts the playing field against American businesses. Um, I think that's and that's just not this isn't me like spitballing here being abstract. Um, And we have documented examples of this. For example, uh, the U.S. International Trade Commission back in the 80s did a study of U.S. steel uh, imports into the western United States. And one reason they said people in the Western United States were buying foreign steel instead of American steel, they specifically said the Jones Act. You know, the high cost shipping, say from you know steel from the East Coast out west, uh, gave you know advantage to, to imports. So I think we need to you know drive home the fact this is very much an anti-American law. I would submit that you know in its most extreme form, actually, you know, it doesn't make it more expensive to buy American products like with LNG. You just you can't get it. You just don't. Um, and, you know, I'm usually in the position of arguing for free trade and saying, you know, imports are a good thing. They contribute to our economy and they do. But I also don't think we should be tilting the playing field, you know, against Americans and putting them on the back foot. So I think we need to let, educate people. Yeah, go let ahead. Me ju- let me jump in on this because I grew up, you know, in the I'm a kid of the 80s. Reagan's America, you know, say all you want about Reagan. He made it cool to be an American again. You know, the American dream became free drinks and cheap debt, you know, so. Uh, and so I kind of had this issue from a political front that I think you have from a political front 
now that I've been an energy guy for all my career, we kind of have it in triplicate is when you look at the psychological studies on how you change someone's mind, the three most effective ways are the Socratic method, just asking questions, incredibly effective at changing people's mind. Uh, Number two, you make them laugh. I got a whole diatribe about how I think kids today are way more liberal than they should be because of Jon Stewart. I mean, I watch Jon Stewart every night. I didn't agree with him on a lot of stuff, but man, I thought he was funny. And quite frankly, if he made me laugh enough, I'd look at something a different way sometimes. And then the third and most unfortunate way that you change somebody's mind is scare them. You know, and I think that liberals have always been good about you're killing grandmother, you know, all those type of stuff. The environmentalists have been really good at the world's going to end in 10 years because of hydrocarbons and all. The least effective way to change somebody's mind, facts, figures, and reason. It just is. And I think one of the things conservatives have always done, and Reagan was actually really good at, Reagan sold the positive vision of conservatism and, and, and that sort of stuff. But I think, you know, throwing facts, reasons at stuff, never very effective. Uh, and we do that. We, we do no advocacy and energy. And when we do it, we sit there and scream a bunch of facts and figures because we're a bunch of geeky engineers. And it's never that effective and all. So in our information campaign, we can't do this with facts, figures, and reason. We can get together and say, are we going to cross the moral line and start scaring people? You know, and maybe maybe we need to do that. Maybe we need to say, here's how many deaths because of the Jones Act or whatever. Or how are we going to be able to connect on an emotional level to change this? I am now getting off my soapbox if you want to hang up after that that rant. Uh, but seriously, it's it's no. I think I think these, these are great points that you're raising. It's you know, it's not a t- it's not a contest usually of who can produce the most compelling you know info uh, graphics or whatever. Um, but yeah, let's walk through some of these. So you you mentioned the Socratic method and just kind of asking questions. I think that's well taken. In fact, a couple of years ago on the anniversary of the Jones Act passage, I just posted a series of questions on on Twitter for for Jones Act supporters and said, look, I'm just want to throw this open. Uh, to anybody that cares to respond, because I haven't gotten good answers to these questions. And these questions were all along the lines of, okay, you know, let's assume for the sake of argument that Jones Act really is about national security, providing those mirrors and shipbuilding. You know, by what metrics is this law working? Uh, you know, we built, you know, we built one ship this year. Last year, we built one ship. The year before that, we built zero. You know, I think on average, uh, over the last 20 years, we've built somewhere around three ships per year. Put that in context, you know, Hyundai in South Korea this year are supposed to build 47 ships. That's one shipyard. All American shipyards combined, we're talking, you know, one or two. Um, so by what metrics is it working? Um, is and, and let's also, if these are the goals, if this is what we're trying to achieve, is the Jones Act the most effective and efficient way of achieving that? If we want lots of ships, is this the best way of doing it? Um, is, is this effective? Is this working? Um, and I haven't seen good answers to those questions and I have my own answers are no, none of this is working and no, this is not an effective or efficient method of doing it. Um, we know this because for example, okay, so you want ships. Well, you can just subsidize the ships. You can pay ship owners money and just say, in exchange for that money, we get the right to use your ship in time of war. This isn't me spitballing here, making things up. We actually do this right now. Um, there's something like 80 some foreign built US flag ships. These are non Jones Act ships. They're not allowed to operate here in the United States. They have to operate internationally. They're purely you know, uh, taking imports and exports from the US to other countries. And we pay 60 of those ships, five, $5.3 million a year um, is basically a stipend in exchange for the right to use those ships for the military in time of war. My attitude is, we want more ships, expand the program. I have no problem you know, with that. I, but, and we should absolutely meet our national security requirements. I just don't think this is a very effective uh, way of going about it. Uh, look at other things like... You know, even the the shipbuilding part part of it, to the extent we built that one ship, well, that one ship that was built last year, this year, look at look at where the components come from. Like the propeller comes from the China State Shipbuilding Corporation. They're totally reliant on, you know, foreign actors, including some that we're not so friendly with for these, uh, you know, for these ships. 
So in time of war, do we think the Chinese are going to keep selling us, you know, these, these components? Um, and the ship took like three and a half years to build. <laughs> we better hope that war is a long one uh, for for these ships to even, you know, come online. Uh, so I think, you know, just asking some, some questions along those lines. And then also, you know, making fun of it. You, you know, you brought up, we talked about LNG a lot and the, you know, silly example with, with uh, vapor. I think there are plenty of ways to make fun of this law. Uh, you know, I, I threw out the example about rocks and this is not, you know, this is not abstract. In fact, right now in, in offshore wind um, farms up in New England, right now they're bringing in rocks from Europe and Canada uh, because they can't use American rocks because there are no ships to transport the rocks. Uh, this is crazy. We have the example of in Hawaii. Uh, we have uh, Hawaii, the big island, is home to the Parker Ranch. It's home to one of the top 25 biggest cattle herds in the country. And they put some of their cattle on airplanes and fly them uh, to the West Coast because it costs about the same as using a ship. This is crazy. We have flying cattle. Um, <laughs> they can't get access to, to you know, normally the way you transport cattle is what's called a, a livestock carrier. Uh, but there are none in the Jones Act fleet. This is a recurring theme where there's types of ships that just don't exist. So, you know, instead they either have to put them on airplanes or they put them on what they call cowtainers. Uh, these are modified shipping containers uh, that carry cattle. No one else in the world uses these cowtainers. This is a purely Jones Act creation. And, you know, like the National Cattlemen's Association, they uh, regularly pass a resolution uh, condemning the Jones Act uh, because of lobbying from from the Hawaii guys. But these are, again, some of the absurd, silly outcomes. And then very early on in the conversation, you mentioned the cruise ship example. Now, cruise ships, they're under a slightly different law, but very closely related to the Jones Act called the Passenger Vessel Services Act. Basically, the Jones Act is for transporting stuff. The PVSA is for transporting people. So we're talking cruise ships and ferries. And yeah, if you want to take a cruise ship from California, Hawaii, well, you got to stop in Ensenada, Mexico on the way back because you got because if you have to hit a foreign port, make it an international voyage, not a purely domestic voyage, so you can get around the PVSA. Same thing if you want to take a cruise up to Alaska, they all stop in Canada on the way there or the way back to check that box. You went to a Canadian port, this is an international voyage. This created actually um, a real problem during the pandemic because Canada closed their ports to foreign cruise ships. They thought, we don't want these COVID-filled ships coming into our ports. So then the cruise industry said, well, we can't go to Alaska. And that's like 60% of their tourism revenue are these cruise ships that come up. So, so Congress exempted Alaska for a year from the PVSA. So they didn't have to stop at a Canadian port, which means they could spend more time visiting Alaska. Um, but now that's lapsed. And we're back to the previous status quo of, of driving tourist dollars to, to Canada. Um, so there's lots of absurd outcomes and certainly plenty of stuff to, to make fun of. You know, it's interesting because the the nuance to humor and it kind of really digging into the psychological research and figuring it out is the per, you need to make the person whose mind you're trying to change laugh, not you laugh, you know? And so one of the things we get wrong in energy is we make fun of all of these people uh, for doing stupid energy policy that lead to bad outcomes, but it's not making the the person whose mind I'm trying to change laugh. It's making the echo chamber laugh. So I love your examples. We're going to have to figure out how we make the un- uneducated American laugh by that. I'm actually sitting here going, and you know, I throw out all I- ideas all the time, and then I don't do anything because I've figured out. Being unemployed is really good. It's my jam. I'm lazy, so I do this really well. But there's a cute little cartoon in there of somebody wandering around trying to find the Jones Act and just popping up all these funny stories. I mean, you could you you, you could make kind of a, a quirky cartoon of where's the Jones Act or you know where's Waldo or some take on that that could be really funny. Yeah, you know. Um... <sighs> Talk about cartoons. Uh, a couple of years ago, the Washington Examiner published a cartoon about the Jones Act, and it showed Uncle Sam holding, uh, handing over a wad of cash to Vladimir Putin, who's sitting uh, on some barrels labeled LNG. Now, of course, LNG doesn't get transported in barrels. 
And he's holding up a piece of paper that says Jones Act on it. So basically, you know, we're forking over dollars to the Russians uh, because of the Jones Act, kind of making fun, kind of making fun of it that way. But yeah, your 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 point's certainly well taken. That's that's uh, yeah. No, it really is. It it is crazy. And look, I've you know I've always kind of been libertarian leaning and all that. And I do get you know if everybody's reasonable and it's easier to live in a libertarian world than some of the folks we have to live with. You know, I do get that. And anytime you draw a a line somewhere, it's tough, but man, the world's a better place with uh, fewer lines because as, as nefarious as the passing by uh, Senator Jones was the unintended consequences that just keep piling on. uh, I mean, it, it, it's when things cost more, Poor people suffer. It's not me and you. It it is poor it, people, and and I just hate that, and I hate that people don't recognize that. Well, yeah, let's take it a step further. It's not like poor people, but who uses these Jones Act ships? Well, it tends to be people, you know, in the non-contiguous states and territories: Alaska, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Guam. Um, you know, like every Jones Act container ship operates there. There are no Jones Act container ships, you know, go from Boston to Houston or Miami or something like that. It's all, they only use these ships where there's no alternative. There's no, you know, there's no trucks, there's no rail. Uh, that's when you use a Jones Act ship. So in effect, who's paying for these? Well, it's the people who live there. Well, Puerto Rico has, last I checked, like a 41, 42% poverty rate. And, you know, we're subjecting them to some of the world's highest shipping. Uh, you know, Guam, I think, has, has similar uh, problems. Uh, and then you think about the fact that if this is truly about national security, well, national security is national. We should all pay for it. That's what this is really about. But what we're doing is we're saying this is national security, and then we take a huge part of the bill and we stick it to the, you know, less than 2% of Americans who live in these places. That's not right. That's not fair. That's not equitable. Um, so just from a simple fairness perspective, this doesn't work. Uh, you know, I think it's particularly egregious in the case of Puerto Rico because they don't even have congressional representation. They have one a non-voting member of Congress, no voting representation in the Senate. They can't vote for president, yet they're subjected to the Jones Act, so the world's most expensive shipping. And we wonder why things are uh, as bad as they are there. Uh, and we have these discussions sometimes about how we help Puerto Rico. And I think, why don't we start by we just stop hurting them. Let's, let's do that. How we put that on the table, <laughs> yeah, but you know, uh, no, that's, it's, it's, it's that, crazy. Yeah. One of the, you know, you always talk about the great marketing campaigns of history and I always point out two of them. Uh, one Avis used to do, we're number two, we try harder. They were actually the number four car rentals uh, company in America when they ran that campaign. So totally made up campaign, but very effective, right? Number two on that list of things that weren't true, but, you know, very effective marketing campaign. Hate to say this, no taxation without representation. The colonies did have a representative in parliament. Now, granted, we didn't have a lot of power, but we actually did have a representative. And you just highlighted uh, the thing I always love to say. Puerto Rico doesn't have one, not a voting member. So, yeah. Yeah. And by the way, that one non-voting member, she supports the Jones Act. And last year was given an award by a Jones Act lobbyist uh, for her support of the Jones Act. So again, this speaks to how even in a place like Puerto Rico, you find a Jones Act supporter. Uh, it's, it's, It's crazy stuff. It really is. Colin, you were cool to come on. This was, uh, this was good stuff. Well, Chuck, I appreciate you having me on. I really enjoyed the discussion and a lot of, a lot of the points you raised. It was a great conversation. And I know you need to hear this. If I was, I would give you a hug, but the Cato Institute needs a hug periodically for doing the Lord's work up there in D.C. I, uh, y'all are amazing. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Anything we didn't cover that you thought we should have? Um, well, one thought is that, you know, I gave the kind of steel man case for the Jones Act. You know, I could do uh, why all those things are wrong. Um, you know, why, you know, these these arguments are all flawed. I think I kind of did that in the course of our conversation, kind of exposed some of that stuff. Um, I could do it more explicitly, but, you know, I kind of leave that up to you. Um, you know, you know, uh, when I was in seventh grade, my football coach was Larry Rude, Coach Rude. 
And anytime we'd lose a game or something uh, and we'd go down the excuse path of, well, they did this, they were holding, the refs did that, Coach would always say, look at the fucking scoreboard. And I think you did that really well. Look at the scoreboard. We don't have any ships. You know, so we could certainly, if you wanted to talk about beating I up, say, right? yeah, I, th- I think you spiked yeah. the football. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we're, right. we're okay. in the ships, you know. I mean, even I got yeah. it. Dumb, dumb but me see, got it. Gets, but I actually gave it too much credit because the thing is, like, you know, the, the like the head of the U.S. Transportation Command a couple of years ago, he was testifying before Congress, and someone – Asked him very directly, so what about Jones Act ships? What are your plans for them? And he said, look, uh, we've done war gaming, and we don't really count on using Jones Act ships in our war. And like a couple of years ago, like the U.S. released a the Maritime Administration released a strategy document, and they referred to those those subsidized ships. I told you about the 60 ships. That's our primary source of, sh- of sea lift. It made no mention of Jones Act ships. It, in fact, it's very rare that these Jones Act ships ever get used for the simple reason that, you know, if I take a ship that's normally going to Hawaii or Puerto Rico and use it to carry goods for the military, well, who's feeding the people in Hawaii? You know, you can, so these ships aren't even really available and they rarely get used. I mean, it has to be like literally a World War III type scenario for, for these ships to ever get used. And there aren't very many of them. But again, this might be a little bit in the weeds. And, you know, and if you think that already knocked it, um, knocked those arguments down, I'm, I'm happy to leave it as it is. Yeah, nah, it was crazy. Well, in all seriousness, thanks for coming on. This was uh, this was really cool. What I'll do is I'll get it to uh, to Jacob, get edited. I mean, I don't think anything's going to get edited. It's more normalizing our voices and all that sort of stuff. And, uh, you know, shoot it to you. And if you want me to wait for approval for you, happy to do it. If you no, feel like, no, no, it's good. Everything's cool. It's we'll fine. Just- no, I'll shoot it. No. I'll shoot it to you in advance, and uh, and uh, we'll uh, we'll publish. My thought is it may be published next Wednesday or the next Wednesday. Okay, sounds good to me. And you know, I appreciate uh, you know you reaching out and inviting me on the podcast and your willingness to talk about this. Yeah, no, it's uh, I don't know, it's kind of my pet peeve. Uh, I great. Yeah, no, I mean, and my tinfoil hat has been too right the last few years. It's making making matters even worse. So, uh, you ever get to Houston? Look me up. Beers on me. Well, also, I'll tell you something else. You know, Senator Cruz. I mentioned that he introduced that legislation. Well, since then, you know, Cruz is now the ranking member on the Commerce Committee. So, if Republicans get the say, he'd be chairman of the most relevant committee for overseeing Jones Act issues. That doesn't mean that he could single handedly overturn the law, but he'd be in a great position to have like hearings and kind of make life uncomfortable and kind of raise some of the nonsense that's going on. So, it might be something worth keeping an eye on. Yeah. And, and, you know, say what you want about Senator Cruz. I mean, as smart, smart as anybody in the Senate. I mean, he's really, really sharp. And you get him outside of a camera, delightful. I mean, actually a really pleasant person, very smart, very thoughtful, very curious, inquisitive. We um, we do a conference called Empower, and it's Bitcoin mining for the energy business. Because we, we kind of take the position of, at the end of the day, Bitcoin mining is all about energy cost. Ultimately, the energy companies will do it, you know. And we're starting to see that flared gas, et cetera. I mean... They don't advertise it, but EOG, Conoco, all these guys are Bitcoin mining uh, because it's, in effect, a way to use stranded stranded energy. So Ted Cruz was our headliner two years ago at it, and we had breakfast with him, kind of like 25 of us the the next day. I mean, he really is smart, thoughtful, all that sort of stuff. We got to get him a front man, though, if he's going to go against the Jones Act because he doesn't change anyone's mind. You know, yeah, yeah. His partner crime say, on that is, is, yeah. I say that with love for Ted Cruz. He doesn't change anybody's mind, right? Yeah. Um, by the way, while I'm thinking of it, the only other thing I can think of, maybe we're talking about, but again, maybe I already covered this. Is you kind of asked about a political strategy, and one thing I thought for a long time is if you step back, there's actually a really interesting. Uh, potential anti-Jones Act coalition to be built. I mean, you could have like, for example, so we have Ted Cruz has criticized it. We've had AOC 
criticized the Jones Act last year. She called for like a one year exemption for Puerto Rico from the law because, you know, she's not doing the obviously she doesn't come from the same perspective I does. She, I do. She just looked at it as like, this is bad for Puerto Rico. I kind of represent Puerto Rico. Um, so there's this really interesting coalition we built. It could be like, you know, wackos like AOC. You could have Ted Cruz, the um, American Farm Bureau, like the farmers, they hate the Jones Act because, it, you know, they're transporting, you know, cheap commodities. Transportation costs are a big deal for them. Obviously you got the oil and gas people. You have, you know, libertarian, you know, free market types. You have environmentalists should be on it, screwing up the offshore wind industry. Um, you got all the extra pollution, you know, from trucks going down highways. That stuff could be going on more CO2 Give friendly. Give me a Kardashian. Get a, get a Kardashian yeah. in there and we got well, it. What, we got what it. I've said, you know, what we need is we need to get like J-Lo and uh, some ben of these Affleck. other Puerto Ricans. Yeah, get, uh, oh, there you get, go. There uh, you yeah. go. We get we get J Lo. We get uh, what's his name that uh, did uh, Hamilton, Lin Manuel Miranda. There you um, go. Get some of the you know other Puerto Rican singers and kind of you know make this an issue. I feel like that would do you know a hundred million times more than whatever I could say. Uh, yeah, there we go. I like it. I'll go. I'll go figure out a way to do that. Big concert. I love to have concerts. Yeah, love a concert me. against the Jones. Yeah. Back in the 90s, you used to have those Tibet concerts, right? We need to make this the the, the, the cause yeah. that everyone rallies behind. Free Puerto Rico. <laughs> there we go. Uh, so anyway, really cool you uh, came on. Get to Houston. Let me know. I'd love to buy you a beer. And uh, anything we can do to help. So I don't know what you know, but the short version of Digital Wildcatters, we publish 10 podcasts. We have... Um, uh, we do live events, particularly a lot around energy technology. We do this thing called Energy Tech Night. Think Shark Tank meets WWE. We have get these energy tech companies up there, do a product demo. The audience, you know, fueled on beer and pizza, cheers, and whoever wins gets a wrestling belt. And we get 300 people at these things. Um, we generally kind of, the community we've built with all this content and live events I like to call it a cult, not a community, but we generally have a lot of young folks in the energy business. I'm kind of the 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 zoo animal. Look, there's an old 55 year old white guy, you know? Wow. Uh, you know, so I'm definitely I'm I'm not a boomer. I'm Gen X, but it's only by three years. Um, but we've kind of built this community. We're working on a knowledge share app. Um, ultimately we're doing some cool stuff with AI on the jobs front as well as kind of energy education stuff. So anything we could ever do to, to, to help you guys on that front, we're happy to do. I appreciate the offer. And again, I appreciate you reaching out. I'm glad we were able to make this happen. Cool. Well, I will be in touch. All right. Look forward to it. Take care. And if you'll leave All kind right. of that screen on your computer up for 15 minutes, just in case. Yep, we'll do. Awesome. Thanks, ma'am.